Harry, that was a beautiful song. Communion is the second Sabbath of June, so you could use this as a rehearsal. <laughs> that was beautiful. The two of you did a wonderful job. I invite you to open your Bibles to the 12th chapter of the book of Daniel. I hope you've enjoyed Daniel as much as I have. We're in the final chapter. Chapter 11 was the second longest chapter, and Daniel 12 is the shortest, 13 verses. It is Daniel's final vision before he goes to sleep and rests waiting for the resurrection. Imagine, Daniel began chapter 1 as a captive. He spent three years in the school of Babylon to become a wise man. But at the end of chapter 2, God promotes Daniel to the role of a prophet. And sometimes we read these stories, we think about these people, and we think, man, what a wonderful life they had, what an amazing story they had. Daniel had so many ups and downs in his life. You think of that first chapter. Everything that he knew, everything that gave him security was taken away. Amen. The temple was destroyed. It was taken from his family, from his friends, and dragged all the way to Babylon as a captive. He spent three years in the school of Babylon learning things that he knew that were not true. They even changed his name. In chapter 5, he's totally forgotten. The king, Belshazzar, doesn't even know who he is. It's his mother who says, you need to talk to Daniel. And he'll tell you what that hand that has written the message is all about. And the king promotes Daniel to third most powerful man in the kingdom. And Daniel says, I don't think so. It was that very night the kingdom of Babylon came to an end. Daniel chapter 6, because he was a man of prayer, because he was a prayer warrior, he is thrown into the lion's den. And after that experience, he's promoted as prime minister in, in Persia. And it's interesting that if you look at Daniel chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 12, like bookends, they're both about the fall of Babylon. One is about the fall of the literal city of Babylon, the destruction of the temple, and one is about the fall of the spiritual Babylon. Both chapters are about God's faithful people, trusting in their faithful God. And both present about the test that God's people go through before reaching triumphal destiny. We'll start with the first three verses of Daniel. Notice in chapter 1, it says, At that time, Michael stood up. Now the reason that Daniel writes that is because he didn't use chapter separations like we have in our Bibles today. So verses 1 through 3 are actually connected to chapter 11 of Daniel. So at that time, Daniel stands up. So when the end time king of the north attempts to destroy God's faithful people, Michael will stand up. Now as you remember the sermon on chapter 10, we learned that Michael is a name for Jesus Christ, Michael the Archangel. And the act of standing has two significant messages. It signals the conclusion of God's judgment and probation on humanity. Jesus, as he stands up, is about to become a king and claim his people. Amen. It also signals that he's about to stand up for his people. If you hold your finger in Daniel 12 and, and flip to Acts chapter 7 and verse 55. <coughs> Which gives us another picture of Jesus standing up. Acts 7, 55. You all there? But being full of the Holy Spirit. Now, this being full of the Spirit is a reference to, to the deacon Stephen. 
that he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. This time when Jesus is standing, it's marking the end of probation for the Jewish nation. And the gospel is now going to go to the Gentile people. It is also Jesus standing up for Stephen because he knows that Stephen is about to become a martyr for Christianity and for God's kingdom. Second part of verse 1 says, And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. If you enjoy reading Great Congress as much as I do, you go to page 614. You, you can read about this time of trouble. Are you having trouble? Yes. I think you just knocked your... No, I'm still here. We're good? We're good. We're good. That's more like a bag in front of us. marks the probation ending for the Jewish people. And then we go to the second half of verse 1, there should be a time of trouble. And in Great Controversy 6.14 talks about this great controversy, this great time of trouble. And the only way that God's people get through this time of trouble is through the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and a total dependence on the Holy Spirit. And it's during that time of trouble recorded in Great Controversy is when the, when, the, when the plagues are falling. And the devil is doing everything he can within his power to kill God's people. And it's referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble. Then the last part of that first verse, it says, at that time, your people shall be what? Isn't that encouraging? The devil unleashes all his arsenal. And God says, those who trust me, those who who allow their sins to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus, those who are, who are surrendering to the Holy Spirit, they will be delivered. Not most of them or some of them, but everyone who trusts completely in Jesus, listening to a spirit and allowing their characters to be transformed, everyone who is found written in the book of life will be delivered. From the outside, it looks like that the God's people will be destroyed. But it's not so. We're told in Daniel 12, Daniel 12, no matter what Satan hurls at us, God's people will be delivered. They'll be tested and tried. And then Daniel has this un unusual statement he makes to us. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Jesus talks in John chapter 5 about two general resurrections. So if you hold your finger and go over to John 5, verses 28 and 29, Jesus talks about two general resurrections. In John 5 it says, do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. The great good up morning. Verse 29. And will come forth those who did good deeds to a resurrection of life, and those who committed evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. So Jesus is describing these two resurrections. One of the righteous, which happens at his coming, the other is the resurrection of the wicked, which happens a thousand years later. But in Daniel 12 and verse 2, 
Daniel is not talking about the general resurrection. He says, some righteous will be resurrected, and some wicked will be resurrected. Well, the question is, who are these two groups that are unique from the general resurrection? Well, Revelation 1, 7 tells us who the wicked are. It says, Behold his coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth shall mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. So those who played a major role in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ will be part of this special resurrection. But who's the other group? The righteous group. Well, Great Controversy 637 gives us an insight. It says, Graves are open, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth awake. Some do have everlasting life and to shame. So all who died in the faith of the third angel's message come forth from the tomb, glorified to hear God's covenant of peace with those who have kept his law. Well, those during the three angels' message will experience that, that special resurrection that takes place. Yes, praise God. Verse 3, Daniel 12. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. I don't know if you've ever been to California. If you've ever been to Hollywood, California, and see that street of stars, you can see the names of all these people. It's considered a great honor to have your name there among the famous. But you know a lot of those people? They're long forgotten. People look at it and say, who was that? The Bible says that many kingdoms shall rise, and many kingdoms shall fall, and many shall crumble into dust. But the stars that orbit the universe will be established for eternity. And this wise is referring to God's people, those who are sharing about Jesus' love with family and friends and relatives. He describes them as the stars and, and as wise. Verse 4, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Gabriel's about to tell Daniel that his, his journey is over. And soon, he'll close his eyes, and when he wakes, You'll see Jesus coming to clouds of glory. Amen. That's a wonderful promise. Amen. It says that this book was sealed, but it's not saying that the entire book was sealed. It's saying that which references the 2300 day prophecy, which Daniel is still struggling with, that was, that was to be sealed. to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. I remember the first time I heard this as a young Christian discovering about the Seventh-day Adventist Church. People talked about science and how knowledge is growing. When you think about it, in the 1800s, people were still on horse and buggy, weren't they? And now they're talking about driverless cars that you just Turn it on and it takes you wherever you want to go. But this knowledge to and fro is about the book of Daniel. Amen. It's about the prophecies of Daniel. Amen. And that what Daniel was telling us is that many will be studying this in the end of time. They'll be studying these prophecies. Let's notice verses 5 and 6. Then I, Daniel, looked. And behold, there stood two others, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the one on the other side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And Gabriel's been talking to Daniel, trying to explain these things to him. And there, in the middle of these two angels, Stands Jesus. Amen. And he asked, How long? 
So Daniel is wondering, when is Israel going to be reestablished? When are our people going to go back from Babylon back to Jerusalem? That was, that was his burden. But, Daniel, but Gabriel has been giving Daniel this lengthy prophecy about the 1260 and the 290 and, and now the 2300. And, and Daniel's head is just spinning. You ever had that experience when you're hearing these things explain? You're wondering, how does this all fit together? And Daniel was asking, what does all of this have to do with the reestablishing of God's people in Jerusalem? <coughs> and Daniel was saying, and when is this time of the end going to happen? Of course, Daniel's hoping it happens before he passes, which we know it didn't. Verse 7, and I heard a man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, which he held up his right hand and his left hand to, unto heaven, and swore by him that liveth forever that it shall be for a time, times, half a time, and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. There were those time prophecies, times, times, and half a times. And Daniel saying, please explain this. This is a 1260 day prophecy, or a 1260 year prophecy. When the little horn power, which he's been talking about in Daniel 7 and 8 and 9, when the little horn power will be that persecuting power against God's people. And that the time, times, and half time would end in 1798. When the book of Daniel becomes unsealed. And remember, during this time period, it was against the law to read the Bible. It was against the law to even own a Bible. Now for us, owning a Bible is an easy thing. But back then, owning a Bible was a major accomplishment. Especially means you could be executed. They were burning Bibles in the streets. Verse 7, And when the power of the holy people has been accomplished, shattered, all these things shall be fulfilled. Because this will be fulfilled after 1798. Verse 8, and I heard, but I understood not. You ever had that way? When you first became an Adventist, was that your experience? I heard these things, but I really don't understand. Or maybe you were raised as Seventh-day Adventist and you hear these prophets and you said, I still don't understand them. And he said, he said, I, oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? In other words, when's the end going to come? And in verse 9, very gently, he said to him, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Jesus responded to Daniel's question gently and compassionately. But he said, It's not for you to understand, not at this time. Not till the end of the 1260-day prophecy. And Daniel knew he wasn't going to live the other 1260 years. He was already 90 years old, which was amazing for his era. It wasn't Daniel's privilege to understand these prophecies as it is our privilege to understand them. Amen. And to share them. Verse 10 says, Many shall be purified, made white, and refined. It's referring to our robes being washed in the crimson blood of Jesus and made white. You remember when Adam and Eve sinned and they clothed themselves with fig leaves and God said, that's never going to work. They lost the righteous garments of Jesus. And when the resurrection morning comes, when Jesus comes in the clouds of glory, God's people will be clothed in the righteous robes of Jesus Christ. Only those who faithfully engage in this work of character development will be found righteous in the judgment and will go through the great time of trouble. And that part of verse 10 says, But the wickedly shall do wickedly. What a contrast. 
Those who have surrendered their lives to Jesus will continue to grow more and more like Him, and the wicked will become more and more unlike Jesus. He says, none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So in 1798, the preaching of these prophecies, the unveiling God raising up a people. Now verses 11 and 12 give us a couple more prophecies. Verse 11 says, from that time, the daily sacrifices shall be taken away. In other words, Satan has been doing everything he can to undermine the heavenly sanctuary. To undermine the ministry of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary as our high priest. In fact, Satan is so committed to this, he creates his own priest ministry. In which a person can go and confess their sins and think they've been forgiven. He says, at that time the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that make a desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. How many years is that? 1,290. Now, that 1,290 is the same period as the 1,260, just that it starts a little earlier. Actually, it's talking about 30 years earlier. So, one event marks the beginning of the 1290 prophecy. Well, Emperor Justice declared that the Bishop of Rome was to be the head of all, over all religious matters of the empire, the corrector of heretics. And the civil power began to make these decrees possible. So, 538, the last opposition to this decree was put out when the Orthodox were defeated and began the 1260 day prophecy. In 508, to mark the beginning of the 1290s, was one of the barbarian tribes, the Franks, which today we know as the French. King Clovis became an emissary to, to the Pope and he used his powers to overthrow the Visigoths one another enemy of Rome. The Viscals were, were anti-Trinitarians. They were Arians. And they were challenged to the authority of the church. And Clovis conquered the Viscals and established the full authority of the papacy. Verse 12, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred in 530 days. So we have the 1260, which is the time of the, of the papal Rome, 1290, which is 30 years before, which Clovis establishes the, the, the papacy, which continue, contains that 1260. And then we have 1,300 or 1,335 days. And blessed are those who wait. Blessed are those who don't give up, don't become discouraged. Well, like the 1290, the 1335, after the same time beginning. So if you take 1290 and you add four, 45 more years to it, what do you end up? 1844. 1843. 45 years, 1843. What happens in 1843? Yes, it's the great Advent movement all over the globe. There are missionaries who are studying and beginning to preach about the coming of Christ. And yes, we have William Miller in 1844, well, actually 1843, talking about the soon coming of Jesus Christ. Evangelical churches were not preaching this. Some even were preaching that Christ had already come spiritually. Many were preaching that a year, that the millennium was about to be ushered in. Anybody know what happens after 1844? The great event in American history? Civil War. It devastated many of these churches. They were expecting a thousand years of peace, and instead they got the Civil War. And my favorite pastor, and I love to quote, his name, he lived in the 1840s, 
His name was Pastor George Bush. Yeah. That name sounds familiar? I have no idea if they're related. But he said, Mr. Mr. Miller, I agree with your calculation. I just disagree with your conclusion. So we have three different date prophecies all focusing on the end of time. And uh, Daniel was not allowed to understand it. But God's people living in the end of 1798 to today are given the privilege of not only understanding these prophecies, but also being able to preach them and to share them with other people. Amen. That Jesus is coming, that Jesus is in his most holy place, ministering for us on our behalf. That when he comes in the clouds of heaven, he'll say the judgment is over. Joe says, blessed is he that waited. Remember what happened in 1844, October 22? What happened? The big disappointment. And although there were 50,000 followers of William Miller, after we disappointment, there were only a handful who continued to believe in the soon coming of Jesus Christ. And we discovered that it wasn't the earthly sanctuary that was being cleansed. It was the heavenly sanctuary. And once they understood that, everything else fit in place and made sense. Revelation 14. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead, those who die in the Lord from this moment on, yes, says the Spirit, so they can rest from their hard work because their deeds will follow them. Amen. All those who were preaching in 1843 and 1844, and those who have been preaching for the last hundred and some odd years, and many of them have gone to sleep with Jesus. On the resurrection morning, their work will be completed. So God has given a special blessing Especially to those during the time of the preaching of the three angels' message. Verse 13, but you should go your way until the end, and you will rest then. At the end of the days, you will rise and receive what you have been allowed. Amen. God is telling Daniel, your time is over. You're going to go to sleep. But you're going to experience the resurrection. Amen. What an encouraging way to know when you pass. That you know that you've been promised that you're going to see Jesus on that resurrection morning. Amen. So I encourage each of us to resolve to resolve in our commitment to Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the only thing that's going to protect us in the time of trouble. Amen. Is to resolve that. And to resolve sharing with our family and our friends and our neighbors and the people we work with this great Advent message. To share with them that promise, that hope. God has given Daniel all these visions pointing toward the end of time. Now God has given us the responsibility of carrying on where Daniel left off. To carry on where William Miller left off. To carry on where all the reformers left off. To share with family and friends and neighbors what an amazing plan that God has for us. Amen. Aren't you getting tired of all these, all these disasters? Yes. Aren't you getting tired of all these wars? Yes. Aren't you getting tired of the Little children who are running our government like little kids, fighting back and forth. It's embarrassing. And it's heartbreaking. And so much anger is just screwing up. I encourage you to be faithful for Jesus. We don't know when he's coming, but it's sooner than we realize. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Be courageous. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for 
Daniel's prophecies. And, and Lord, thank you that we get to play a role in the proclaiming of the great Advent message. Lord, give us that courage and give us that wisdom. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.